Oh, may his favor be upon us to a thousand generations. Hallelujah. Praise God. I want the blessings of the Lord in my family. I want the blessings of the Lord on my children, on my wife, future generations. What a beautiful song. Amen. And that's a Bible prayer. It's a Bible blessing. Let's stand for the reading of the Word. Julie, we're glad to see you as well. God bless you. So good to see you back in God's house. We've known her a long time. We're glad she's here. Luke chapter 2, verse number 11. Luke chapter 2, verse number 11. One verse in your hearing this morning. Let's open our hearts and our minds to the Word of God today and let the Lord just encourage us, help us today. Easter is only seven days away. Good Friday is coming up Friday. A wonderful high holy time this is in our nation where people pause and think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful we serve a God that's not still in the tomb. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about that beautiful story, understanding it's not Easter Sunday, but um, just getting us, getting our hearts prepared for that. Luke chapter 2, verse number 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Everybody say a Savior. Which is Christ the Lord. This is the angel, and he is talking to the shepherds in the field. What a beautiful Christmas story this is. And he's saying to the shepherds, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. God bless you. The angels proclaiming to the shepherds in the field this night did not announce, Born this day in the city of David is a healer. Although we know he is a healer. The angels did not say, born this day in the city of David is a miracle worker. Although we would all agree, and many of you have first-hand knowledge, he is a miracle worker. The angels did not say, born this day in the city of David is a counselor. Although the word of God very clearly says he is wonderful counselor, mighty God. The angels did not say, born this day in the city of David is the Prince of Peace, or Jehovah Jireh, or Jehovah Nissi, or Jehovah Shalom, or Jehovah Rohi, Jehovah Sidkenu, or any other title that God has in the Old Testament. They simply said, born this day in the city of David is a Savior. They announced to the shepherds that the Savior was born because this was the greatest role that Jesus would ever fulfill. Don't get me wrong this morning. I am thankful he's my healer. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm thankful he is the miracle worker. I'm thankful he is wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. I'm thankful he's all of these things, but most of all, standing here today, I am thankful he's my savior. Born in Bethlehem's manger was the Savior of the world. And we used to sing a song years ago in Pentecost. He saved my soul from a burning hell. Yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. Anybody, I'm going back in the 80s now. Anybody ever remember that? Some of us old, creaky, dusty people remember that. Saved my soul from a burning hell. Yes, he did. You that are saved this morning and full of the Holy Ghost understand why we're thankful for salvation. Amen. Amen. It's kind of like the Old Testament author that says, Once I was blind, but now I see. Once I was lost, but now I'm found. Once I was lame, but now I can walk. You see, he saved me. Amen. And even reaching further back in the day when the choir used to get up and sing, when I could not come to where he was, he came to me. I'm thankful today that he is a savior. And it was a momentous day when Jesus 
died on the cross. 33 and a half years after the angels announced in Luke 2 and 11, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. 33 and a half years after healing the sick, after raising the dead, after turning water into wine, after stopping funeral possessions, uh, uh, processions, after designating 12 men to be his disciple, one of whom betrayed him. After going through the sham of a trial, he finally went to the cross. And it was a momentous day in history when Jesus gave up the ghost. It would be safe to say that it was the most momentous day the world has ever seen. And the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all record the account where three things happened. First of all, the sun hit its face. There was a total eclipse. Secondly, there was an earthquake and the dead saints came out alive. And thirdly, the veil in the temple was ripped in half, meaning that no longer could only the high priest enter into the Holy of Holies because Jesus was our high priest and he gave his life. Now anybody has access to the Holy of Holies. And after the eclipse and after the earthquake and after the veil ripped in half, that Roman soldier that was standing guard over Jesus fell prostrate on the ground and said, Truly this man was the Son of God. You see, theologians say that Jesus' death is the center of all of eternity. Everything in the economy of God depended on the fact that one day Jesus would die, one day Jesus would be buried, and one day Jesus would rise again. Eternity is a large door hanging on that one well-oiled hinge. Jesus split time in half. Even atheists, which is so ironic and humorous to me, that even atheists that don't even believe in God, when they refer to a moment in history, either refer to it as B.C. or A.D. Acknowledging that the one they don't even believe in split time right in half. Folks, everything we have, everything we can look forward to, everything we can hope for this morning is dependent on the fact that Jesus had to die. And we are here on this beautiful Sunday morning only seven days before Easter, five days before Good Friday. We're here to celebrate not a myth concocted in the minds of marketers across this world. We're not here to celebrate some story about a, a bunny. We're not here to celebrate uh, some kind of a fable or child story. Amen. We're here to celebrate the fact today, getting into this week, that God himself robed in flesh and came to earth, born from the womb of a virgin. He died, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. Thank God it doesn't end there. Thank God we know he's coming back for his people. Hallelujah. And so Easter is not about bunnies and eggs and chocolate. It's not about points and gaining points and seeing who's going to win the Visa gift cards. It's okay for kids to celebrate in these uh, innocuous, innocent ways. Amen. But when the Easter egg hunt is over and you get home next week, you need to be sure you set your kids down and say the real meaning for Easter is the fact that Jesus rose again and he's coming back for his church. I'm thankful he's coming back. Man, I am thankful he's coming back. Come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, we pray. And I'm saying this. I'm going to start saying it on a regular basis because this is the way I truly believe. Every single Sunday morning, I walk from my chair to this pulpit. I am shocked that Jesus hasn't come back yet. That's how close I believe we are to the coming of the Lord. Does anybody believe that? You feel that in the Spirit? Every sign is shaping up. The politics are shaping up. World events are shaping up. Our society is shaping up. Amen. You, you don't need a sign anymore, friend. The sign is there. Which one do you want to look at? They're all there. Jesus is coming back. But on this day when Jesus died, it was a day of confusion. It was a day of tumult. There were many people, many groups of people who witnessed Jesus' death. You see, some only witnessed his death in passing. Some witnessed it 
in every detail. But they saw the death of Jesus from many different perspectives and in different lights. There were some that day who were simply caught up in the, the spirit of mass rioting. People that saw a crowd and uh, heard some commotion and, 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 and sounded, heard what sounded like the sound of, of people rioting and tumult. And they said, hey man, let's go check out what's going on. They didn't recognize Jesus as anybody special. They didn't care what he was supposed to have done. They were simply caught up with the fervent cry of crucify him. There were others that day in the crowd who were familiar with the crucifixion because you see, they had witnessed many of them over the years. They knew that crucifixions were reserved for the most noted and wanted criminals. And to them, Jesus had to be a notable and wanted criminal by the simple fact that he was being crucified. Jesus was just another vile and filthy convict who was going to get his justice from the legal system. Then there were others perhaps in the crowd who had been a little more acquainted with the ministry of Jesus. They had never really forsaken all and followed him, but they never really made commitments to him either. They just knew he was a good man. And they watched him heal the sick. They watched him put eyeballs in empty eye sockets. They heard about the story of the water and the wine. They knew the widow lady whose son was raised from the dead. And they stood in the multitude that day and remembered the kind words he had spoken, the good deeds he had done, and the miracles in other people's lives, some of which even in their own life. They wanted to help, but they were afraid to speak out against the Roman soldiers. So you see, some people in the crowd that day did not think of Jesus as anybody. Others thought of him as a criminal. Others, well, he's a good man, but they kept it to themselves. Perhaps there were others there that day that felt more strongly about his ministry. They thought perhaps Jesus was a prophet sent from God. And in their minds, Jesus was right up there with John the Baptist. Jesus was right up there with Elijah and Elisha and other great prophets. They honored Jesus as a prophet, but yet they too sealed their lips in his defense. They feared the anger that was directed against Jesus would be directed to them. So some thought he was nobody. Some thought he was a criminal. Some thought he was a prophet. Some, he's a good man. And then there were the disciples that were there that day. You see, they knew that Jesus was the Messiah. They watched him every day as he mingled with people. They heard the teachings that nobody else heard. They saw him every day put up with the things that he put up with and wrestle in the flesh and in his spirit. They knew he was God manifest in the body. But they were also afraid. And they stood off with question marks in their minds. They were now in a state of confusion because they had bought into the messianic prophecy that not only was Jesus the Messiah coming to rescue the Jews, but he was going to conquer the Romans who had pillaged their land and was going to possibly put them all into positions of power. And they thought, if Jesus really is the Messiah, how is he dying on the cross? Their hopes and dreams were all shattered as they watched Jesus hang on the cross. And they knew, man, I hung my hat on this man's ministry and now I'm going to be a wanted fugitive for the rest of my life. If he really is the Christ, why didn't he set up his kingdom? So they saw, the disciples saw Jesus from the vantage point of confusion. And then to the core of the crowd that day, Jesus was just an imposter. They were like Saul of Tarshish before God changed him on the road to Damascus. They were sincere in believing that Jesus was a blasphemer by setting himself up to be equal with God. And they were happy to see this imposter hang on a cross. And so as a recap, there were many different perspectives in the crowd on the day that Jesus died. Some said he's a nobody. Some said he's a criminal. Some said he's a good man. Some said he's a prophet. Some said he's my master. And some said he's an imposter and he's getting what he deserves. But on this Sunday morning, I want to call your attention to four different 
people in the crowd. And I've reserved my title for this time. Today I want to preach to you for just a few more minutes. Four different views of the cross. You see, these people were in the crowd, but they were not really part of the crowd. They were close enough to witness the death of Jesus in every single gruesome detail. They were there with every drop of blood as it splattered in the dust. They witnessed every expression of agony on the face of Jesus. They were close enough to hear the moaning and the groaning that uttered out of his bruised and beaten body. They were center stage with him and first hand witnesses as he writhed in agony. And each one of these four saw him in a different perspective on the day he died. I think the most glaring one would be his mother. You see, it'd only be fair to talk about the perspective of mom that day. Mary, the mother of Jesus. When Mary looked into the face of Jesus that day, she saw him in a different light than anybody in the crowd. She had borne him for nine months. She remembered the angel saying, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. She remembered having to sit down and tell Joseph, um, <clears throat> Honey, I'm pregnant. What? Yeah, and it's not your baby. What? It's God's baby. What? She remembers that conversation. She remembers the first flutter. The, the, the quickening of the fetus in her womb. She remembers uh, 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 being in labor and, and Joseph holding up the Christ child. Amen. She remembers the, the shepherds coming in and, and the, the wise men from the east bringing gold and frankincense and myrrh. She remembers uh, the drummer boy, if that ever happened. She remembers him too. Amen. And she remembers the camel nodded his head and all that stuff, if it ever happened. She remembers all that. She remembers Jesus taking his first step in the living room of their Place. She remembers Jesus' first words. And all the women today would like to think that word was mommy. All the fathers would say, no, it was daddy, of course. Joseph would say, no, it was Joseph. But she remembers every single detail of Jesus' life. She can smell the hay of the stable all over again. She remembers him getting his honor roll certificate in school. She remembers reading his report card when he came home and finding it fascinating that at the age of five, he was at the top of his class in every class. World history, 100%. Science, 100%. The comments the teachers would make on the report card. This child is brilliant. This child is explaining chromosomes at the age of six. He was God. In a body. She remembers his first cry. She remembers the first time that he reached up and said, Mommy, please hold me. She remembers waking up in the middle of the night while Jesus had a tummy ache as a child. She remembers Jesus pushing his broccoli away and saying, I made it, but I hate it. Amen. She saw him like nobody else saw him. And when she looked at the cross, she remembered the first days of his ministry, the days when she didn't understand him, the time when her and Joseph left the temple when he was 12 and three days later down the caravan they looked around and Jesus wasn't there and then when they made their way back to the temple Jesus said, Know ye not, woman, that I must be about my father's business? All these thoughts are flooding back into her mother's brain. She saw him like no one else saw him because that day she saw him as a son. I'm thankful for his sonship here this morning. Amen. I just want to tell this church that Jesus Christ is not just uh, uh, one who sits on some uh, sits on some far removed ivory throne, unable to identify with who I am and where I am. But he, the Bible says, he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Praise God. Paul said in Hebrews chapter four, verses fifteen and sixteen, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin because of this verse 16 let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace 
that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. You see, the reason why I can quote that verse and we can thank God for that verse is because Jesus went through the same junk we went through because of his sonship. Hebrews 2 and 18, For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able also to succor them that are tempted. The word succor there means sympathize. God is not some far removed deity who doesn't understand hunger pains. He's not some far removed deity who doesn't understand body aches. He's not some far removed deity that doesn't sympathize with your family issues and your mental things that you're going through and your physical problems. Because he was the son of God, he walked on this earth 33 and a half years and he can identify with your problems and my problems he knows all about our loneliness he knows all about our suffering he identifies with our pain but the God we worship today really really identifies with the hurting not only in this room but all of humanity The second person I'd like for you to consider their unique perspective was another Mary, but it was Mary Magdalene. You see, Mary Magdalene was not isolated by fear. She was right at the foot of the cross. You see, when Jesus first found Mary Magdalene, the Bible says that she was possessed with at least seven devils. We don't know anything about Mary Magdalene. We don't know where she was born. We don't know who her parents were. We don't know her history, how she got to be a demoniac possessed by demons. She probably started running with the wrong crowd. Hey man, let me tell our our folks here today, the devil is nobody's friend. As old Herschel Godair used to say, God rest his soul, sin will take you further than you ever thought you'd go. It'll make you do things you never thought you'd do. It'll keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay. You might think it's a sweet, innocent, little, innocuous relationship, but if you're not careful, you're going to let some things in your life that will come back to bite you. I promise you, Mary Magdalene never walked out of her house and said, today my goal is to to be possessed with seven devils. But if you keep walking down the road with the devil, he will ruin you. By the time Jesus finds this lady, she's hopeless. She didn't want to be the woman that she was. The spirits inside of her drove her to commit wicked deeds day after day until finally somebody called Jesus stepped into her life and he spoke the word. Jesus didn't wrestle with the devil. He never wrestled with the devil. He just spoke the word. A lot of churches give the devil center stage. They make a big deal out of someone showing up and uh, foaming at the mouth and barking like a dog and all that stuff. Hey, let me tell you something. Don't give the devil attention. That's what he wants. We're not going to give him center stage. You ever come in contact with a demoniac? You just speak the name of Jesus and move on. That's all you need to do. There's power in the name. Praise God. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 8, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The word flee there connotes rapid movement. It doesn't say he'll leisurely walk away. It says he will flee from you. Somebody say amen. And Jesus resisted for Mary Magdalene when Mary Magdalene could not resist for herself. Oh, the love of God. What an amazing thing. And so to Mary Magdalene, Jesus was a deliverer. To Mary, his mother, he was the son. To Mary Magdalene, he was the deliverer. And the Bible says, and such were some of you. There are people here this morning who used to be drug addicts. People here this morning who used to be alcoholics. People here this morning who used to be bound by homosexuality and lesbianism. People here this morning who were chronic adulterers. People here this morning that used to cuss like a pirate. People here this morning who were kleptomanias and used to steal anything that wasn't nailed down and then you'd try to steal the nail that nailed the thing down. 
People here this morning that were cheats and liars. Amen. And I could go on and on and on. And the Bible says, and such were some of you. But now you are justified. Now you are sanctified. Now you are washed by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, is anybody thankful? He is our deliverer. Praise God. You see, Mary Magdalene, while she's looking at Jesus that day, she realized if it wasn't for this man right here, I'd still be living in the depths of despondency. If you've ever been set free this morning from sin, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not asking you to stand up and spill all your secrets from your past, praise God. But whenever you start hearing preaching about deliverance, there ought to be something rise up in your soul. He set me free. Oh, he set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus to see. Glory to God. He set me free. Hallelujah. And I've got good news to this church this morning. He's still a deliverer. He's still the son. He's still the deliverer. And then to our third person as I'm closing, to John the Beloved, Jesus was a friend. You see, John the Beloved was the only disciple promised a non-violent death. Jesus and John were very close. Amen. And uh, Jesus, of course, loved John. I'm thankful today that Jesus is still a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. Enoch was the friend of God. Abraham was called the friend of God. John was the friend of Jesus. And can I tell this church here this morning, he'll be your friend. You say, I don't have any friends today, Pastor. No, 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 that's not true. You've got a friend that will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, lo, I will be with you always. Even Don't you listen to the devil tell you you don't have a friend. <laughs> Praise God. He'll be your friend when nobody else is your friend. The Bible says he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He's your first friend when you're born. He's your last friend when you walk away out of this world. He's your friend. And he'll be your friend today. Maybe you're hurting today. Maybe you're going through some sort of trauma in your life. Amen. And you think, my God, my family's forsaken me. My husband's forsaken me. My wife has forsaken me. My kids have forsaken me. My, my father, my mother, my brother, my sister. I don't even have anybody I can trust. But you need to understand, Jesus said, I will always be there for you. I'm your friend. Praise God. And then the last perspective out of four that I want to highlight today. Mary, the mother of Jesus, he's the son. Mary Magdalene, he's the deliverer. John, the beloved, he's my friend. And then last of all, and I think most importantly, and it goes back to my text in Luke 2 and 11. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. The last perspective this morning is the thief on the cross. You see... Even in Jesus' death, he was reaching one more time. Even in moments of agony, he was reaching for one more person. Because even though he was the son, even though he was the deliverer, even though he was a friend, he was born to be a savior. His birth was announced by an angel. He's a savior. And the last act, it is so fitting that the last act Jesus did before dying was save one more person. Praise God. You know the story. The two thieves are hanging there. One of the thieves is just riling on Jesus. I mean, he's just, he's just pouring it on him. Why don't you save yourself and save us if you really are the Messiah? And the other thief, as life is draining from his body, he's hanging there. And he says, how about you shut your mouth? We deserve what we got. You and I both know we're guilty. This man has done nothing. 
And he looks at Jesus. And in one final moment of desperation says, Please remember me. Please. And Jesus says, Today. <laughs> Not tomorrow. Not next year. He says, Today. Thou shalt be with me in paradise. Oh, friend. You say, well, he didn't get baptized. He didn't get the Holy Ghost. No, he didn't because Acts chapter 2 hadn't happened yet. You say, well, he wasn't a Jew. He didn't go through the proper sacrificial process. No, he didn't because the Old Testament door was closed. You see, this thief was one of the few that got in in that tiny little dispensation, amen, during the life of Jesus Christ. But even in Jesus' death, he stopped and said, I know I'm a son, I know I'm a friend, I know I'm a deliverer, but really, I'm a savior. I'm gonna save this last person. Woo! Come on, somebody. I'm glad he's my friend. I'm glad he's the son of God. I'm glad he's my deliverer, but I'm so thankful he's my savior. Let's all stand together this morning. Hallelujah. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And I promise you, friend, when that thief closed his eyes and woke up on the other side of glory, the very first thing he did, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Where? I'm going to thank him for being my Savior. Praise God. If you don't have the Holy Ghost today, you're in the right place to get the Holy Ghost. You say, Pastor, I, I need deliverance. Oh, oh, you're in the right place for that too, but he's your Savior. If you're here today and you don't have a friend, you're in the right place, but listen, he's your Savior. If you're here today and you need to be delivered, I'm thankful you're in that place where God can set you free, but hold on a minute. He's your Savior. If you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, we can baptize you this morning. Amen. We're going to baptize uh, one of our precious young children uh, in a a little bit. But if you are here today and want to be baptized, I want you just to say, God, take my sins away. Forgive me. Purge me. Wash me. Cleanse me. I can deal with all the other junk later. But right now, I need a Savior in my life. I wonder if you'd lift your hands with me this morning all over this house. As Brother Marcus begins to play, come on, let's lift our voices. Let's pray for people today that need a Savior. This next week as we celebrate Easter, I want you to begin to think about how much you appreciate the fact that He's my Savior. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. You saved my soul from a burning hell. Yes, you did. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm thankful you're my Savior. I'm thankful you're my Redeemer. I'm thankful that you rescued me. I'm thankful that you looked at me and said, Today you shall be with me in paradise. Oh, hallelujah. There's anybody here today, God, that needs their sins forgiven. I pray that you'd wash them clean. Forgive them of their sins, Lord. There's anybody here today that has never been baptized in Jesus' name. Let today be the day when they go down in water and have their sins washed away. There's anybody here today that has never received the Holy Ghost. Let today be the day that they receive the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Hallelujah.